Hello, I'm Dr. Eric Lavonis. I'm an emergency physician and a medical toxicologist and the Associate Director of the Rocky Mountain Poison and Drug Center here in Denver, Colorado. And we're going to talk about the management of snake envenomation in the United States. Uh, by means of disclosure, uh, my employer is the Rocky Mountain Poison and Drug Center. We do a lot of research. So we have research consulting, call center, and pharmacovigilance arrangements uh, with the makers of several uh, different antivenom products. Um, all of that money goes to my employer and none to me. I have no personal or family financial conflict. Snake envenomation is a major disease worldwide. The World Health Organization has designated snake envenomation as a neglected tropical disease. Worldwide, there are on the ballpark of a million envenomations and probably about 75,000 deaths from this disease. If you look at the world map of this, when we Americans talk about snake bite, the rest of the world looks at us and says, what are you guys talking about? This is a very significant disease for an individual patient in the United States, but I need to acknowledge going into this that this disease is a terrible public health burden, burden in parts of the developing world where the snakes are more common, the snakes are more deadly, and subsistence agriculture is the way people survive. This talk is specifically talking about snake uh, bites that we see in the United States. If you are in another part of the world, you want to consult an expert in that part of the world. Here in the US, uh, we're not very good at counting diseases, but we think about 9,000 patients seek treatment in an emergency department in the United States every year for snake bite. Now, some of them will have dry bites. Most of them will have envenomation, ranging from very, very trivial to uh, very, very serious. On average, there's about five deaths a year in the United States. So one of the first things that I tell patients when I meet them is, don't worry, the vast majority of people with uh, snake bite do well. Um, everybody who sees me seems to think they're going to die and really deaths are quite rare and the folks who are going to die for the most part are critically ill on presentation. You can tell uh, who they're likely to be. Of the snake bites in the United States, the vast majority are by pit vipers. Uh, we're going to spend the majority of our talk uh, talking about pit vipers today, but I do want to acknowledge and we're going to talk about coral snake envenomations, which are about 200 patients a year in the United States and exotic snake envenomations. All those international snakes that made that map turn colors, uh, people keep them as pets, and, um, uh, and they do bite people in the United States too, mostly in Florida, as it turns out. Let's talk a bit about coral snakes in the United States. Now, this is a, a famous rhyme, and it's worth knowing, particularly if you spend time in the outdoors in the southern United States. Um, in the United States, a snake with red uh, touching yellow on the banding is likely to be a coral snake, likely to envenomate you. Um, there are some snakes which are brightly colored and have stripes like my dad's old ties uh, that are harmless, the king snake being the most common. So red on yellow could kill a fellow, red on black, friend of jack or venom lack. Please do not apply this rule outside the United States. It, misapplication of this rule, the right rule in the wrong uh, continent can kill you, but for the United States this works. Uh, coral snakes in the United States are very much a regional thing. We have three species in the United States. The eastern coral snake is the one that's by far the most medically important. The range map that shows, that's shown here is a little old. It's probably getting more towards Florida, a lot less of this in North Carolina, certainly. Um, the Texas coral snake is located in, guess what, Texas. And then there's this Arizona or Sonoran coral snake in Arizona, which is um, kind of the wimp of the three, medically speaking. Uh, unlike rattlesnakes that we're going to spend a lot of time talking about shortly, coral snakes have this very inefficient envenoming apparatus. If you look at their teeth, they don't have fangs. What they have is teeth. They're kind of sharp. They have grooves down the middle, and the venom kind of rolls along the grooves and into the wound. Um, for the most part, these snakes need to bite uh, and hang on for a little while to inject a significant amount of venom. Um, I will say, don't bet your patient's life on this. There are plenty of cases out there of patients who had a quick scratch who end up getting quite ill. Uh, but for the most part, these snakes really have to work to get enough venom into a large mammal like you and me uh, to cause medically significant effects. Um, coral snake venom in the United States is a neurotoxin. It's like, it's like slow-acting rocuronium or slow-acting um, uh, vacuronium. So just like those drugs that we use in surgery all the time, it's a non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocker. It works on the postsynaptic side of the neuromuscular junction, and it causes neuromuscular paralysis. So patients who die from coral snake bites die because they're paralyzed and can't breathe. Um, and they will do okay with just supportive care, except that the venom takes weeks to wear off. The on -snake, onset of symptoms from coral snake envenomation uh, is often delayed. Uh, the largest series of this showed a median of about six hours from bite to onset of symptoms, but the range is tremendous. Some patients within five minutes, others took a whole day. 
um, in the United States, coral snake bites cause little to no tissue injury. Again, uh, if you go international, you're going to have international variation. But in the U.S., what you really see typically is a scratch and then slow onset of paralysis. Um, this is a, an injury that you can risk stratify. Eastern coral snakes are by far the worst of these. Everyone agrees that eastern coral snake bites can kill people and require treatment. Uh, Texas coral snakes, there's some argument uh, with different experts in Texas saying we do or we don't treat these. Uh, Soren coral snake or the Arizona coral snake uh, essentially never require treatment. They're very low risk envenomations. And although I would c consult a local expert when dealing with one of these, by and large they're not nearly the worry that the other two are. With the eastern coral snakes, if you look at the largest case series of these, the patients who got in trouble were either children, right, small host, same amount of venom, small host, or adults where the snake, snake bit and hung on and was able to sort of do this chewing motion and get extra venom in. Um, so one of those would be a high risk exposure. An adult with a strike and fall off would sort of fall down to medium risk along with the Texas coral snake. There is an anim for cor antivenom for uh, coral snakes. It actually is US government license number two. So it's an extremely old product. Uh, it is a first generation antivenom product. We'll talk a little bit later on about how antivenoms are made, but this is produced in horses. It has 1950s technology for the purification steps. Uh, it's just a very old product and technology has sort of moved on, um, but this is such a small disease that we don't see, um, uh, we don't see antivenom development in this area. Should you treat the doses three to five vials IV? Uh, because this is an older horse serum product, the manufacturer recommends skin testing. We'll talk about that in a minute. But about 20% of people who get coral snake antivenom will have adverse reactions. Uh, nonetheless, this antivenom is life-saving. There was a concern that it was going to go completely out of production, and it almost did, uh, but production is uh, starting again. I want to talk a minute about skin testing. So skin testing is a, is a technique that's done with older antivenoms to risk stratify patients. What you do is you either take the antivenom itself, or these things come in a carton with a vial of normal horse serum, um, and inject it intradermally and look for signs of allergy. Um, the problem with skin testing is it's not 100% accurate and it's not 100% safe. There have, are patients who have um, had uh, skin testing with no sign of allergy who've gotten antivenom and had life-threatening allergic reactions. There are also patients who have had life-threatening allergic reactions to the skin testing. Um, so generally speaking, I don't do this every time I'm going to use a horse serum-based antivenom. I do it when the results of the skin testing will change management. For example, if I had a coral snake patient who's uh, starting to get neurotoxic effects who may become paralyzed for three weeks if I don't treat, I'm going to treat that patient regardless of allergy. And what I would do rather than spend time skin testing is begin treating the patient, uh, always, always, always being ready to manage an airway and always be prepared for anaphylaxis. On the other hand, if you have a marginally indicated case, um, it will then, if you had somebody who had a skin wheel, then you would perhaps hold off. So do the test, as with all tests in medicine, only do the test when it will change management. This is really used for older equine antivenoms. We don't need to do this with a modern pit viper antivenom, which is highly purified and made in sheep. We probably will not need to do this with the newer um, Mexican antivenom that everybody expects to come to the U.S. in a few years, although we don't um, have U.S. experience with that product yet. If you're going to do it, how to do it, the easiest thing is pull out the package insert and read it. What it says is take either the vial of normal horse serum or the antivenom, dilute it 10 to 1 with normal saline, inject a very small amount intradermally, and watch for signs of allergy, either a wheel and flare reaction, hives, or wheezing. Um, an interesting question comes about, do you treat everyone? Historically, in places like Florida, where they see a lot of these envenomations, all patients were just empirically treated. With the antivenom shortage, um, there was a change in practice due to some watchful waiting, and some colleagues uh, from the Florida Poison Center looked back and found something really interesting. So looking at this slide, the empiric group are people who came in without symptoms and got antivenom without waiting for development of symptoms. The withhold group were people who came in without symptoms and were watched and only received antivenoms if they developed symptoms. The number of patients who progressed to intubation was not significantly different. Uh, but the uh, number of people who had moderate and major outcomes was actually higher in the empiric therapy group. So it may be that you harm more people with an antivenom first strategy than by a watch and wait strategy with this disease. If you're managing one of these, uh, consult a local expert. Um, I've never practiced in Florida. 
Um, and this is something where I would really encourage you to get the best local knowledge. You've got some time in most cases. That said, in general, all patients with coral snake envenomation who are showing neurotoxic symptoms need antivenom. The problem, antivenom does a great job of preventing progression of paralysis. Uh, however, it does not reverse paralysis that's already taken place. So you never want to get behind the eight ball with, these, with one of these envenomations if you can help it. Empiric treatment for an asymptomatic patient in that high risk group, um, I think two years ago we all would have said yes. Now I think the answer is maybe, uh, based on the result of that study I just showed. Uh, consult a local expert. And if asymptomatic patients at moderate to low risk, what I would do with these people is get hold of some antivenom and make sure it's ready, uh, observe the patient, and treat at the earliest signs of neurotoxicity. Now what if you're in a situation where you have to buy some time? You have somebody with early neurotoxic signs and you don't have antivenom avail available and ready. You're in trouble, uh, but there's some things you can do. One is to use neostigmine. Um, much as the anesthesiologists do to reverse neuromuscular blockade, that can buy you some time. And of course, you can always intubate the patient if need be. I'm going to talk a little bit about exotic snakes. There are hundreds of types of snakes in this world, and they have all sorts of venom effects, including uh, very severe neurotoxic effects, including direct muscle injury, direct kidney injury, direct cardiac injury, horrible tissue destruction, uh, uh, clotting, uh, or anticoagulation. Um, nobody can keep them all straight in their head except for a few experts. The good news is there's help. First of all, you have your poison center to use as a resource. And um, we have databases where we can look these things up. Um, the way that antivenom is procured for these things is the zoos that stock these animals keep antivenoms uh, on hand to treat their employees, to treat the zookeepers. Um, they're brought in under a special IND process approved by the Food and Drug Administration. Um, and the American Zoo and Aquarium Association and the American Association of Poison Control Centers maintain something called the antivenom index that helps if we need to match up a patient to an antivenom, helps you figure out, or helps the expert figure out what antivenom you need and where to get it. Uh, we really try not to use this system. One problem is that the quality of international antivenoms are not up to FDA standards sometimes, and resupply can be problematic. Just as we've had drug shortages in the United States, Antivenoms have been dealing with shortages for a while, and it creates a real problem for the zoo. If they're keeping, say, a king cobra, they lend out their king cobra antivenom to help some person who kept a king cobra as a pet and got bitten, and then they don't have any to protect their own workers. So it is a big deal. Uh, we try not to use it, but if you're in a pickle, call your poison center, and they uh, should be able to help. Okay, now that we've taken care of the less common venomations, I want to talk about the things that we really see much more commonly in the United States. About 9,000 people in the United States are bitten by uh, pit vipers every year. Pit vipers are rattlesnakes, pygmy rattlesnakes, and the moccasin snakes, the cottonmouth and the copperhead snake. Uh, and there's some qualitative differences between them we'll talk about, or some quantitative differences. Uh, but fundamentally, we've got the venom in, in all of the North American crotaline snakes do basically the same thing to different degrees. Um, if you wish to care to identify the snake, there's a few things you can look at. One is this nice triangular shaped head that crotaline snakes all have. Uh, the um, the uh, colubrid snakes and the coral snakes have more of a round or oval shaped head. Now, when these animals are alive and angry, the colubrid snakes, um, garden snakes and those sorts of things, have a very nice little mimicry that they do where they arch their mandible back, arch their jaw back, and um, make their head look more triangular. Neat trick, sort of imitate the bully on the block. If you look at the picture of the head from the side here, there's a couple distinguishing features. The one that's easy to spot is the elliptical pupil. Think of it like a cat's eye pupil um, or a lens-shaped pupil. Um, that's distinct to the crotaline snakes, and you don't see it in coral snakes or the non-venomous snakes in the United States. Um, all snakes have nostrils. Uh, they smell to, to help find their prey. The pit vipers also have a heat-sensing pit that is caudal to the nostril um, that they use to help detect their prey with heat. If you look quickly and you see a dot, you've just looked at the nostril. The pit's a little bit harder to see. Um, if you're looking at the fangs, you see these front hinged fangs that are like hypodermic needles. So they've got a hollow center and holes in the end, and they're very efficient injecting venom. Uh, if somebody brings you only the back half of the snake, which actually isn't all that uncommon, uh, there are ways to look at the um, plates caudal to the anal plate. Basically, rattlesnakes have them all the way around. Not all rattlesnakes have rattles for a variety of reasons, including trauma. Uh, but those are some things you can look for. 
looking at things a little bit more closely, uh, in this snake you can see the cat's eye pupil very clearly. You can see the nostril and the heat sensing pit. I would not suggest you get this close to a snake in clinical practice. Uh, we had a very amusing week, uh, unfortunate but amusing week in North Carolina when I was practicing there uh, with a snake that got loose in the emergency room, um, causing a little bit of consternation. And then the following week, uh, or later in the same week, uh, the next hospital uh, down the road, um, a physician reached into a bucket to look at the snake a patient had brought in, got envenomated himself. Luckily, they had enough uh, antivenom to treat uh, both the original patient and the doctor who became the second patient. Uh, kids don't try this at home. Um, we don't need the snake ID. Most of the bites in the United States uh, that are reported to poison centers, well, most of them are unknown. And then of the known bites, they break about evenly between copperheads and rattlesnakes. Um, the nice thing is we don't need snake ID. Snake IDs tend to be unreliable anyway, and in the end you can treat what you see. We talk about snake bite like it's a snake problem, but I do point out to people that really the problem is overlapping range between two different vertebrate animals. One is the crotaline snake, like this uh, very um, upset looking uh, cotton mouth here. And the other is the North American tattooed redneck and other uh, sorts of people who tend to pick them up and bother them. Snakes do not hunt people for prey. Snakes would really actually prefer not to bite people because they can't eat us. And if they expend their venom uh, biting a person in a defensive strike, that snake doesn't get to eat for two weeks until more venom is regenerated. Um, so in general, leave it alone. Now this is a great example of how not to hook a snake. Um, I, for my personal uh, rule, is very simple. If it doesn't have arms or legs, don't touch it. Um, uh, certainly there's lots of people out there uh, who've made mistakes and just about everyone I know who even trained snake handlers uh, has been bitten more than once. So um, please just leave it alone. Uh, yes, there is a demographic to snake bites. It's just you can't do a snake bite talk without talking about the seven T's. Um, this does tend to be um, a disease of people who pick up and handle the animals. Not always. Uh, but the, um, it's uh, telling to say that uh, women bitten by uh, snakes in the United States, about half of the bites are on the upper extremity, about half are on the lower extremity. In men, it's 80-20, 80% of the bites to the hand because men are dumb and do things like tease, pick up, juggle, and otherwise harass perfectly uh, innocent snakes that uh, really would rather not be hurting us. So uh, pay attention, uh, go it alone. This is a, friend of, this is a picture of uh, my uh, good friend, mentor, and colleague, Russ Kearns as we were hiking, and I would point out that hiking in shorts in rattlesnake country probably wasn't the wisest thing that we did that day, but we were certainly very careful where we put our feet and uh, had no plans to pick up or bother any snakes that we saw. So what's in pit viper venom? Well, you know, animals grow things for a reason. Pit vipers have venom because they want to eat. Um, snakes uh, of this type can't chew their prey, and uh, they eat things that are live, like mice. Um, so they need to rapidly immobilize the prey so the prey doesn't kick the living daylights out of the, animal, out of the snake's mouth and then turn it into a liquid so that it can be digested chemically. Um, in order to do this, uh, pit vipers have evolved this complex mixture of somewhere between, depending on the snake, 20 and 50 different toxic components. Uh, generally speaking, proteins of one kind or another, um, some metalloproteinases and, and other sorts of things. It's an absolutely fascinating subject area that we're not going to go into today. I'm just a dumb ER doc. I try to put things into boxes. Venom here has really three main functions. It digests mammalian tissue, has inflammatory and vasodilatory effects, that's to immobilize and rapidly kill the animal, then anticoagulant and antiplatelet effects. There are also procoagulant enzymes in here, which will show you some pictures of what that can do. But systemically, the, the disease you're going to be treating is an anticoagulant or an antiplatelet effect. What do we see clinically? More than 95%, essentially 100% of patients who get pit viper venom in are going to have limb injury. Um, redness, swelling, tenderness, um, tissue injury uh, as a direct cause of the venom effect. Some percentage depends tremendously on the snake that gets you. Uh, we'll have coagulopathy or thrombocytopenia, sometimes both. And then you can see systemic effects, either systemic bleeding from the coagulopathy, hypotension, or in some cases, neurotoxic effects, which we'll talk about in a bit. This is a great example of a very straightforward, uh, um, relatively minor finger envenomation. You can see uh, where the venom has caused tissue lysis. You've got a hemorrhagic vesicle there. What I did tell this uh, very nice lady is I don't know what the tissue under that's going to look like. There could be a lot of destruction. There could be very little. Um, there's no reason to debreathe this right now. The patient's got a biologic dressing on with her own skin. Um, but that's a good example of what the tissue injury can look like. 
I think this is the same lady on the other side of her finger, and you can see how the venom spread a little bit subcutaneously, and she's causing uh, dermatolysis. Um, uh, this is actually somebody different, but that's okay, who um, you can see is the inflammatory mediators track up the lymphatics, the entire arm gets swollen up to the axilla. No, it is the same lady, I remember her, I remember her now. Um, and yet the venom effects in the finger, actually she did really well. Uh, this is somebody who um, was, uh, decided that he was mad at a snake for biting him and punched it. Um, not something I generally recommend. But you see a lot of tissue injury here, um, probably from uncontrolled venom released from the snake. It is true that snakes can gauge the amount of venom they inject. Uh, so if a snake is biting a small mouse or a large rat, that's very important. Uh, humans are off the scale uh, when it comes to that, and it's really not relevant to human envenomings. And besides that, you don't know how much venom was injected. You don't know when the snake last ate. You don't know the snake's general state of health, its age, any of that. What you know is you've got a person with venom effects, and you're going to treat what you see. It's a good example of some swelling. It's also an example of how we traditionally do limb uh, swelling measurements. What uh, we've done in this case is uh, put a tape measure around the forearm in three locations, marked above and below the edge um, so that you're measuring the same spot each time, numbered them so that you can keep track, and do serial measurements over time, which helps us track. I actually find this less useful than I used to, um, but it's certainly traditionally taught. Uh, once again, um, punching the snake that just bit you is really not a recommended uh, thing. Uh, probably it's not the snake's fault. Cutting and sucking the venom is also not a good idea. Should one pay, first of all, don't play catch with your pet cane brake rattlesnake. Uh, if you do uh, and you get bitten on the finger, uh, don't cut and suck out the venom. Um, cutting and sucking actually is a very ineffective way to remove venom, although this person uh, um, uh, unfortunately demonstrated that sometimes you do get meaningful amounts of venom out. Um, you don't want to cut uh, something, the name of which you learned in medical school, like a nerve or a tendon or a, or a joint space. Uh, and you don't want to suck and get venom into your mouth and cause airway edema. Now, this patient ultimately did well, but um, you know, terrifying for all concerned, I'm sure. Uh, likewise, venom extractors uh, don't remove uh, venom effectively. They just cause tissue injury. Uh, this lady wound up on the uh, wrong end of a viper bite. Um, we'll show her finger in a minute, but you can see um, all the ecchymosis up her arm as she had capillary bleeding. If you look carefully in the inside of her arm, um, you'll see a line of vesicles. I've got a much better picture of that effect. Uh, but one thing which we could have done better in this case was to splint her arm in full extension. For a while, her arm was at 90 degrees of flexion, and the venom got hung up in the crease there. And uh, I've uh, subsequently uh, uh, improved my care by not doing that anymore. Probably should have improved my care by wearing gloves in this picture, but um, we we'll, won't say that. This is an example of what happens when the digestive enzymes really work badly. So this was procoagulant effect from the venom locally and tissue destruction, and she lost this finger. Um, there, was, there was no saving this, and we did try everything. The, the um, anticoagulant antiplatelet effects can be a big deal. Now again, there are procoagulants that work locally, and sometimes you'll see that in a local tissue injury, but systemically, the snakes we have here in North America don't cause systemic clotting. Uh, what they do is they have anticoagulant and antiplatelet effects. So there's a thrombin-like enzyme that cleaves uh, fibrinogen, but it cleaves it off to one side, not in the middle, so you get these lopsided, ineffective D-dimers. Uh, low fib fibrinogen consumption and therefore Protime, PTT, elevated risk of bleeding. Um, separately, there are also platelets, uh, antiplatelet factors that cause platelets to either be destroyed directly or clump and get sequestered in the spleen. Uh, so thrombocytopenia can also lead to bleeding. This is not DIC. Um, so this is you know, the common cartoon version of, of how our blood clots. Um, DIC would have been a consumptive coagulopathy with microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, blood clots forming, and consumption of the whole cascade all the way down. That's not what's happening here. What's happening here is uh, you're um, destroying your conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin, con consuming the fibrinogen, not making fibrin that's capable of cross-linking. Uh, so all of the tests that go through this pathway are going to be abnormal, but it's not DIC. If you were to measure effector 7 levels, they're not affected at all. About half of rattlesnake victims will have this to some severity. Ballpark 5 to 10 percent of copperhead victims, much less common problem than copperhead victims. Um, it can develop early, it can develop late, it can develop early, respond to treatment, and recur. Um, generally speaking, the vast majority of people who have late, late hematologic venom effects will have had some form of them early. Um, so we look hard for it early because it tells us which patients are at low risk. 
When they happen, they can last up to two weeks. Fortunately, medically significant bleeding is very uncommon. Um, here's the lady with the black finger that I showed you earlier. The reason her finger is in a cup is because we tried applying leeches to help with the microvascular thrombosis and try to get her some venous outflow from the finger. Didn't work, but we weren't going to go down without a fight. Uh, but you can see all of the bleeding into her arm. She required some red cell transfusions, even the ecchymosis down her chest wall there that you can see. Uh, these can be very significant injuries. Uh, this is a picture from the literature, but this is a patient with um, severe recurrent coagulopathy uh, from an upper extremity bite. You can see the hematoma all the way down his flank and that large hemothorax on his CT scan. Um, very uh, significant injury for this gentleman. Compartment syndrome, fortunately, is quite rare. Bites that look like compartment syndrome are very, very common. So snake, uh, if you remember back to the picture of the snake fangs, those snake fangs are curved and they tend almost always to inject in the subcutaneous space. So you get subcutaneous edema. That subcutaneous space gets red and tender and warm and it presses on things and it hurts to move the leg. So you have a lot of the soft signs of compartment syndrome, pain out of proportion, uh, everything's swollen and tight, hurts to move. Um, so it's very, very common for people who don't treat snake bite frequently to look at these and say this person looks like he or she has compartment syndrome. Um, you do need to be concerned, but the vast majority of the time that's not what's going on. This picture of true proven compartment syndrome is very, very rare. Um, and I would keep in mind that fasciotomies and digital dermotomies uh, are great. They have great functional results, but cosmetically they're terrible. I wouldn't want somebody doing this to my child unless there was truly compartment syndrome present. We'll talk about that a bit more. So I mention it only to say it's rare. Neurotoxicity is very regional. It's only a few snakes that do this pretty commonly. So the neurotoxicity from pit vipers is fasciculations and myokymia, which are two different ways that the nerves and muscles start uh, reacting in a disorganized fashion. It can lead to paralysis and airway loss. Um, it is frequently seen with Mojave rattlesnakes in California. Interestingly, not so much in Arizona. There's, there's variation within the species. And Southern Pacific rattlesnakes, again, sort of California. You will definitely see rare cases with Mojaves outside of California with timber rattlesnakes, cane brakes, eastern diamondbacks. Rarely, rarely pra prairie rattlesnakes, but it's mostly a Mojave and Southern Pacific rattlesnake problem. Uh, treatment is antivenom. It usually responds, though not always. Take a breath. We're partway through the talk. Uh, we're through most of the gross pictures. We're going to talk about treatment. So first aid. The, the answer to any first aid question for snake bite is no. Do not play side. And, and actually, really, by the time they get to you, somebody has done one of these things or more. So it means stop that. Uh, we don't put ice on snake bites. Uh, the reason for that is because historically, when cryotherapy was used very, very actively, um, there was tissue injury. By, that, by very actively, I mean limbs submerged in a bucket of ice water for hours. Um, a little bit of ice probably doesn't hurt, but it certainly doesn't help. Just take it off. It's not doing anybody any good. Remove jewelry that could be constricting, same as any traumatic injury to a limb. If the patient comes to you with a tourniquet, uh, what I would do is make sure you have IV access, make sure you have a basically stable patient, uh, and then get that tourniquet off. Um, constricting bands are recommended for neurotoxic snake bites, like coral snake bites, or like the neurotoxic snakes from the rest of the world. We don't recommend them for pit viper bites because we don't want to trap venom in the limb. Remember, essentially 100% of patients have some tissue injury to the limb, and deaths are, what, five out of 9,000. Um, so in general, we don't want to trap the venom. We want to allow the body to work on the venom. Um, there's a great debate about whether the limb should be in a neutral position or elevated. Personally, I'm an elevator. Um, in the field, I would keep it neutral, and in the ED or the hospital, I elevate. Um, there's no data, and uh, it's, you know, we can always have passionate arguments when there's no data. Uh, and again, no cutting, no sucking on the wound, no snake venom extractors. Uh, perhaps the best titled medical, medical, medical article I've ever read uh, was an editorial about this that said, venom extractors don't remove venom, they just suck. We'll leave it at that. And again, don't mess with a snake, right? We just said that copperhead, cottonmouth, and rattlesnake venom basically does the same thing, just to different degrees. I don't need the species to treat the snake. I actually don't need to know much about the snake at all, um, unless it's an exotic or something like that. Uh, live snakes absolutely can still bite. In fact, they will try to, and I don't blame them. Dead snakes can still bite. The record I know of is a taxidermist who was removing a snake that he'd been freeze drying from a freezer. The snake had been dead for a year, still caused a medically significant envenomation. Uh, cell phone photos from a safe distance are nice, um, but don't mess with the snake trying to bring them in, and there's no reason to kill the snake either. 
uh, one of the worst envenomations I ever saw was somebody who stomped a snake to death, and the snake's dying act was to really, really inflict a terrible bite in this, uh, uh, in this otherwise pretty reasonable gentleman. Um, if he had just left the snake alone, uh, everybody would have been better off. Standard therapy it is standard therapy. IV fluid, sure, treat pain, of course. Update tetanus if needed. Antibiotics are a no. So when we say this patient has cellulitis, what we mean is the, red, the wound is red and warm and tender um, because of an inflammatory response, the presence of bacteria in the wound, right? Well, here we have an inflammatory response because of the presence of inflammatory mediators in venom. Antibiotics don't neutralize venom. They have no role here. If you have somebody who has purulent drainage from a wound, say three to five days out, yeah, sure, that's less than 5% of patients. So we do not give antibiotics routinely or as likely to cause an allergic problem as you are to help. Keep the limb neutral or elevated. Again, I'm an elevator. Um, uh, I let these patients eat once I'm sure they're fairly stable and not headed to the OR. This is the best example I've ever seen of why not to immobilize a patient like this. Right, this gentleman had his limb immobilized at 90 degrees as the venom was coming up the lymphatics. Uh, you see that it slowed down, he had more tissue injury there. So when I immobilize these patients, what I do is I put the arm up, I put a splint behind it, just a plaster splint with lots and lots of Webrol, which I hang from an IV pole, and I keep the arm flexed in no more than about 45 degrees. Um, you can do it with band net too, but I find putting a splint behind makes it a lot easier. Lower extremities are easier, you just put it up on a few pillows. Patient assessment, a basic history and physical, uh, serial vital signs, of course. Um, those circumferential measurements, the more I do them, the more I find there's so much variability from measurement to measurement, they're not so useful. But I certainly do mark the leading edge of swelling and tenderness, and those may not be the same spot. So I'll take a, a surgical skin marker or an ink pen and just put a line and say swelling 8 p.m., swelling 9 p.m., and that really helps me understand uh, where things are going. Keeping in mind that as time goes by, if you get the limb elevated, gravity is just going to bring venom proximally. But if you've got proximal extension and this is getting smaller, then, then you're not getting worse. Basic labs, CBC, which includes a platelet count, uh, PT, PTT, and fibrinogen. I do those on arrival. Uh, if somebody's in trouble, if they're coagulopathic, I'll check them more frequently. Otherwise, routinely, I'll grab another one at six hours and then another one right before discharge sometimes more in between if I'm treating a coagulopathy instead of just screening for one. Again, the extremity measurements that we talked about, I think proximate extent probably gets us uh, as much as this, but it is sometimes useful if I've got somebody with a lot of swelling that's redistributing, if I can say, hey, the hand's actually getting smaller as the, as the upper arm's getting bigger, now I can distinguish gravity versus worsening. Let's talk about antivenom. So antivenom has been around a long time. Immunotherapy has a long and huge history in the United States. So it was first clinical use was described more than 100 years ago, 120 years ago. Um, antivenom is derived from the serum of vertebrate animals that have been immunized and then hyperimmunized to the venom that you're dealing with. So what you're doing is, uh, you know, we love our monoclonal antibodies in, in US medicine, but the problem is you've got 50 plus venom components you need to um, take care of. So rather than try to be hugely scientific and have this huge mix of, of monoclonal antibodies for a lot of different things, you just use an animal's immune system and let it figure it out. Uh, so it's fundamentally a low-tech process um, that's extremely effective, and we use it to this day. Um, this is the production process for the modern U.S. pit viper antivenom. Um, so uh, this particular antivenom is made using four, uh, they actually produce four different types of uh, antivenom and then mix them. So they take venom from eastern diamondback rattlesnakes, western diamondback rattlesnakes, Mojave rattlesnakes, remember the neurotoxin, and water moccasins to get in a kistardin snake in there. Um, it, milk the venom out of the snake, inject it into sheep, inject it into sheep, inject it into sheep until those sheep are making massive amounts of IgG directed against this venom. Then they take the sheep serum out of the sheep, um, precipitate out the immunoglobulins, cut those molecules uh, using papain uh, so, that the hint, so that the stem, the FC portion of the uh, molecule, uh, is not retained and you have just the two light FAB chains uh, that are actually what binds, the, um, uh, binds to the venom. Uh, this then goes through column affinity, column affinity purification. So what that means is um, there's a process to take out anything that's not, as much as possible, like anything that's not an IgG, that binds snake venom. So the state-of-the-art purification process. It's lyophilized, which is a fancy word for saying freeze-dried like your Sanka, and uh, packaged, labeled, and 
sold to you. Worldwide, you can make antivenom in almost any vertebrate animal. Uh, horses and sheep are used uh, commercially. Camels in a few parts of the world, um, actually it can be done in chicken eggs, uh, um, which I think is going to be a, an antivenom method of the future. Um, there's been some great proof of concept. The target species, it depends on what you're treating, right? Our coral snake antivenom in the United States just goes against single species. In um, our pit viper antivenom is directed against four species, knowing that the other 40 or 50 related species, you'll have enough crossover to work. Uh, and then there are other technical details with the choice of, um, of venom that's used and the purification steps. When we talk about whole IgGs, FABs, and FAB2s, this is my cartoon to look at this. So this is an immuno immunoglobulin G molecule. So the FC is the constant portion. That's the uh, part that activates the human immune system. There's an omega receptor sort of at the bottom of this slide. Um, and then the two ends of the wire, the FAB for the antibody uh, or the antigen binding portion. So the two things at the top of the Y are what sticks to the snake venom and activates it. Um, uh, Crofab, the antivenom we use in the United States for pit vipers now, is cleaved um, by papain. So you get these two light chains that are about 50 kilodaltons. They can't cross-link and they don't uh, have the receptor to bind to the immune system. Uh, the FAB2 antivenoms, we'll talk about one that's likely to come to the U.S. market uh, in a few years, uh, are cleaved with pepsin, so they cleave below the hinge region there. You now have a 100 kilodalton molecule, bigger, longer half-life, a little bit less tissue penetration, theoretically can cross-link. Lots and lots of article, uh, lots and lots of arguments about which is better, uh, but suffice it to say that both are used uh, worldwide and uh, both produce great antivenoms. In terms of the trade-off for which one, whole IgGs uh, have longer half-lives. They're large molecules. They stick around a long time. They're probably more immunogenic to us, and we don't want to be hypersensitive to things. FAB2s are in the middle. The FABs into the tissues better, theoretically less hypersensitivity, uh, but shorter half-life, and they can be cleared faster than you'd like. Um, where ideally you'd be on this spectrum is, again, a point of debate. We won't get into it here. Uh, so there's, um, historically, we talk about the Wyeth antivenom. Um, I don't talk about that much in these talks because it hasn't been available in the U.S. since 2002. It's of historical interest. So let's just say we had a first-generation equine whole IgG antivenom. It caused a lot of allergic reaction problems. It's gone, and it's not coming back. Uh, the current antivenom we have now is trade named Cro Crofab. It's been available in the U.S. since 2000. We described it before. It's made in sheep and very highly purified. The goal for this antivenom was to come up with an antivenom with the lowest possible risk of adverse reactions. There's another antivenom that has finished phase three clinical trials, is under FDA review as of the day I'm recording this talk, uh, that if it is approved would come to the U.S. market in 2000, late 2018, uh, in time for the 2019 snake bite season. It's called Anavip. It's made by a very reputable um, Mexican antivenom manufacturer. It's been sold in Mexico since, I think, 1984. Uh, it is an equine molecule, but it's uh, um, made with modern production methods. It's a fab too. Uh, and we're just going to have to learn a lot more about this. It's going to be years before it's available for use, and uh, then we'll have to see. So why give antivenom? Well, first of all, antivenom slows and halts the progression of tissue inflammation. So it doesn't raise the dead. This is not the Lazarus effect, but it can um, uh, you know, protect the tissue that's not dead yet. Uh, it certainly has good effects on blood pressure. It certainly reduces tissue compartment pressures. Uh, administration of antivenom is pretty reliably followed by improvements in fibrinogen and platelet levels. And it will usually reverse the neurotoxic effects. Not always, but it generally does. So when do we give it? In patients with progressive swelling. So I got called last night about a, a young lady um, who had been bitten by a rattlesnake uh, who had forearm swelling, uh, whose forearm swelling was progressing. Um, so we gave her antivenom to stop the progression of the swelling. Had it been stable, I would have said, let's watch and see if it progresses. Um, patients with significant coagulopathy, I don't mean an INR of 1.4, but something I might, that might actually lead to a problem for the patient. So arbitrarily, INR greater than 2 or protrime greater than 2 times control, fibrinogen less than 50, platelets less than 50,000, or trends that are clearly going the wrong way, right? If your platelets went from 400,000 to 151,000, you know you're going in the wrong direction, just get ahead of it. And then systemic venom effects, hypotension, bleeding, severe neurotoxicity. Those are all indications for giving antivenom. How much? Well, we're currently only dealing with one antivenom in the United States, the Crofab, and the dose of that is four to six vials at a time, repeated as needed until you get initial control. What's initial control? So all of these indications that we talked about here, 
aren't happening anymore. So the swelling is no longer progressing. The pro-time fibrinogen platelets are either normal or trending in the right direction. Um, and there's no major systemic venom effects. Patients not bleeding or having severe neurotoxicity or that sort of thing. Typically, patients will get initial control with one or two doses. Um, some of us, many of us, if we're treating somebody with life-threatening envenomation, we'll just go right out and double the dose uh, the first time and start out with uh, 8 to 12. Uh, I don't do that most of the time because of the cost, but if I have somebody who's hypotensive and dying in front of me, um, then I'll double up front. Um, in general, the treatment, therefore, it's iterative. So this is an adaptation of the treatment algorithm, which I'll kind of point you towards at the end of this talk. But fundamentally, assess the patient. Look, is there a sign of envenomation? If you think, if you have puncture wound, first of all, assess the patient. And, you know, maybe you get lucky. Hey, look, we have a picture of the snake, and it's not a venomous snake. Great. Tetanus shot wound care. Um, you know, send them home. If there's puncture wounds, uh, with an unknown snake or definitely a crotalin snake and no sign of envenomation, you may be lucky that may be a dry bite, but every snake bite expert I know has been burned in this situation, and we recommend observing patients with apparent dry bites for at least eight hours. Um, and that's simply an experienced thing. We've seen people wind up on the wrong end of this. We know people shortcut that all the time. You know, sending a patient home with instructions to come back is probably reasonable. Personally, I watch them for eight. If you have signs of envenomation, then the question is, is it a trivial envenomation or something that meets an anti-venom indication? Sometimes you'll have patients who have a bite, just a little blood bilster, no swelling, anything like that. And there's a temptation to watch them a few hours and send them home. Again, every snake bite expert that I've consulted with on this, uh, including me, has been burned in this scenario. And we watch those patients for 12 to 24 hours. We admit them, either to our ED OBS units or to the hospital, watch them because some of those apparently minor envenomations um, can turn out to be something serious. To tell you a simple real world story from a number of years ago, I took care of a patient who was actually a very skilled bow hunter. He was kneeling down to take his shot and he knelt on a timber rattlesnake. Timber rattlesnake, probably didn't want to have somebody who weighed 100 times what he does, uh, bit this gentleman in the shin. Uh, such a skilled bow hunter, he actually turned, fired, and decapitated the snake with an arrow, which is impressive. Personally, I would have probably nailed my foot to the forest floor, but um, anyway, so we had a great snake ID. We had both halves of the snake, uh, and the patient presented actually to another hospital with a very minor uh, envenomation, just a scratch and a couple blisters. They washed him for a few hours and sent him home, which was within standard of care at the time. Um, he uh, ended up having delayed progression of swelling that took off about 12 hours later. By the time he was done, he was swollen from his bite on the shin all the way up to his nipples, required blood transfusions, his bowel was edematous. Uh, he did fine, ultimately, um, but this was just a real cautionary tale to me, and I share my experience with you. Apparently, minor envenomations need to stay in the hospital. Patients have indications for antivenom. You give them antivenom. As we discussed, four to six vials, uh, reassess and repeat, reassess and repeat until you have that initial control step. And at that point, these patients need to be admitted to the hospital. Um, the manufacturer um, will say, the FDA approved dosing says to provide maintenance doses for all these patients. We'll talk about that in a minute. Not everyone does. And fundamentally, um, uh, eventually you're going to decide this patient is no longer getting worse, trending towards improvement, and is well enough to go home. Like all drugs, and certainly like all biologics, antivenom can cause acute hypersensitivity reactions. And I tell my residents and I tell my fellows, whenever you are administering any biologic to any patient, be prepared to manage the airway. That is true for antivenom, but it's true for all of the others as well. Uh, it's about 8% of patients treated with Crofab. Usually it's rash, a little mild wheezing, some swelling. Um, it's usually a rate-related phenomenon. We actually can generally treat through these by stopping the infusion, giving an antihistamine like diphenhydramine, plus minus a steroid, plus minus some cimetidine, um, reassess the need for antivenom, and then if the patient clearly needs the antivenom, uh, uh, continue the infusion at a slower rate. Um, if you have one of these, please call an expert. We do this all the time and we can help you kind of walk through the, the risk balance. Uh, but it's, it's about one in 12 patients. Um, this is kind of what it looks like. So you can see this young man who's got uh, a moderate severity bite to his upper extremity and hives on his torso from antivenom. Uh, this is somebody where I would look at him and if the swelling was still progressing, I'd probably treat the, alert, treat the allergy, treat the hypersensitivity, and then uh, resume antivenom very cautiously. This doesn't always go well. Uh, this newspaper clipping involves the old Wyeth antivenom, not the new stuff, uh, but this is a patient who died an airway death 
in a very capable hospital under very capable hands um, very suddenly. Uh, and there's another case uh, from another hospital. I know there's two known cases, and I know the circumstances in both. In each case, it was an airway death that happened very suddenly uh, in a very capable facility. I'm not saying don't treat the patient. I'm saying um, do be prepared, uh, have respect. And again, both those deaths were the older product. Um, serum sickness is a, a delayed type hypersensitivity uh, that happens because of ex exposure to excess forward protein. It was much more of a problem for, with the old anti-venom than with the new stuff. Um, and actually, theoretically, could be caused by venom as well. So we really don't know um, whether it's the venom or the anti-venom that's doing this. Uh, it's about one in eight treated patients. It's generally fairly mild. Uh, back in the old Wyeth antivenom days, we would send patients home uh, with an envelope. If a patient lived nearby, I'd just give them a card. If they live far away, I'd give them a card and an envelope, and I'd say, if you get a rash and flu-like symptoms, give me a call. And when they called, we'd say, yep, sound, we'd talk to them, ask them a few questions, make sure they're okay, and say, sounds like you have serum sickness. Take that envelope to the pharmacy. It's got a prescription for some steroids, some antihistamines. You're probably going to be fine. Uh, it's not always minor. This is an example of kind of a minor case of serum sickness, a garden variety. Again, yeah, with a modern antivenom, it tends to be less common and less serious than with the older stuff. This is what it can look like when it's uh, really bad, and occasionally patients will get rehospitalized for this, though generally not. Uh, the primary side effect of modern antivenoms is um, poverty, cost. Uh, this is an old slide. This is a patient bill. He was kind enough to scan his bill and send it to me. Uh, this patient got 10 vials of antivenom back uh, when it first came out in 2002, and that was the hospital markup on 10 vials of antivenom. Um, the hospital cost for this product has more than doubled since then. Um, nowadays, we would have probably given him less antivenom, and at any rate, um, don't make the patient suffer permanent harm based on cost, but do respect that um, you're spending a lot of your patient's money or somebody's money on this, and like all things in medicine, you should have a good reason for doing what you do. Let's talk about recurrent venom effects. Um, so the, the good news is the modern antivenoms are very uh, highly purified and quite safe. The bad news is those small molecules um, have a shorter half-life than some of the toxic components of the venom. So about half of patients who receive Fab antivenom will have some recurrence of some venom effect. If it's local tissue venom effects, that means you know, the swelling stabilized and then gets worse again. Generally, that's somewhere between a uh, half a day and a day and a half after initial control. Uh, it essentially always responds to retreatment, so I don't worry about this much because I can always manage it, uh, but recognize it does happen. Uh, the hematologic venom effects, the recurrence tends to be much less predictable. Um, uh, later in onset, I really should say more like one to 10 days, there's some well-proven cases later. Uh, it usually responds to retreatment, but not always, and even when it responds to retreatment, sometimes it'll recur again. Uh, this is a dramatic case of somebody who really didn't uh, do well um, uh, from a coagulopathy standpoint. So the, if you just look at the graph on the bottom, uh, that's his platelet count. You can see that it went um, you know, nearly to zero um, uh, shortly after envenomation, responded great to the first dose of antivenom, recurrent thrombocytopenia, got antivenom again, had a little dead cat bounce, came up a little bit. Um, back down again, now got antivenom and platelets, and the transfused platelets didn't even stick around real well despite a lot of additional antivenom. He eventually did well, but you can see this uh, large uh, um, extending flank hematoma. Um, cases like this are rare. Uh, we did a look through published cohort studies in the literature. Out of uh, a bit over 1,000 patients in cohort studies, not the case series, but the studies where they take all the patients from one institution, we found five out of 1,000 patients who met our definition of medically significant late bleeding, basically a major drop in hemoglobin or required transfusion. So half a percent, not, it's not common, but it's there. What do we do if there's just a numeric drop in platelets uh, or fibrinogen or a numeric increase in INR without any sign of bleeding? Uh, call an expert because we can help you work through those risk benefit cost balancing things. For minor bleeding, bleeding gums, using an IV sites, we'll generally retreat those with antivenom. Uh, for serious bleeding, a head bleed, a GI bleed, um, bleeding that's going to require transfusion, we'll generally give whatever factor is missing, so FFP or cryoprecipitate if it's a uh, uh, fibrinogen deficiency, or platelets if it's a platelet deficiency, but you always give antivenom along with this because you need to neutralize the process that's destroying your blood products. Otherwise, just given the blood products, they're going to get consumed. 
think of it like a kid with ITP. You never give platelets to a kid with ITP without also giving steroids, because otherwise the spleen is just going to chew up those platelets. Um, same idea, different disease process. So we never give blood products alone. Some of these cases can be quite tricky. Again, uh, there's uh, plenty of good experts around to help you. Some patients actually have trouble getting initial control. Uh, we looked at this in a large nationwide case series and we found in the range of 10-ish percent of patients that never fully got initial control. Um, my colleague Shan Yin did a multivariate analysis, looked at this, and basically there's two strong predictors that stand out, either initial thrombocytopenia or initial neurologic effects. Patients with one or both of those uh, were more likely to have trouble achieving initial control than people without either of those. That said, um, you always try to get initial control. Generally, you do. If you've gotten 18 vials in the patient and you don't have initial control yet, yet hold off and call an expert. Every year I hear about somebody who got 50 or 100 uh, vials of antivenom uh, as they're chasing something that just wasn't responding. And I think most of those cases we can save um, the patient for protein exposure risk and expense uh, just by talking to the case with you. So, you know, pick up the phone. If you, don't, if you have a local expert, call him or her. If not, call your local poison center. Uh, this is what we do is help people through this. After you get initial control, every one of these patients see me admitted to the hospital. I, I will sometimes use our ED OBS unit for the straightforward ones. Um, elevate the extremity like we talked about. So maintenance antivenom therapy, uh, we'll talk about in a minute, uh, but that's a, a plus minus. Talk about what I do. And generally speaking, I send them home. If they're stable with no progression, 12 hours after the last dose of antivenom I gave to treat something or after I'm done with maintenance therapy. Uh, we just talked about management of recurrent venom effects, basically. Treat recurrent effects with uh, antivenom and call for advice. Um, compartment syndrome. This is a bit of a review, but venom effects mimic compartment syndrome. True compartment syndrome is rare. If you have hard signs of compartment syndrome like pulselessness or anesthesia, okay, now I'm really worried. Otherwise, please measure compartment uh, pressures before you consider, do two things for me before you consider a fasciotomy. Number one, measure compartment pressures. Um, you will frequently be surprised that they're not elevated. Second thing is give antivenom. If the patient's bad enough, you think they might have, might think that he or she might have compartment syndrome, then they're bad enough to need antivenom. Give it. Antivenom reduces compartment pressures and improves tissue outcomes in human studies and in animal models. Uh, this is an algorithm that's a bit hard to read on the slide. It may be better on your screen. Uh, this comes from a. a, a an article in the Journal of the American College of Surgeons from a couple years ago. And basically what it says is what I just said. Uh, good supportive care, give antivenom and assess. Uh, if you have hard signs or elevated compartment pressures, then give more antivenom and prepare for surgery. Uh, but don't let the surgeon make that first incision until they've reassessed the patient. I have personally had several patients get to the OR and come out of the OR with no incision because the antivenom kicked in in time. Okay, controversies. Um, there's a lot of medicine we don't know. These are sort of the high profile ones for this. Please don't get this close to a snake. Um, number one is maintenance antivenom therapy. So the package insert for Crofab says, after you, receive initial, after you achieve initial control, give an additional two vials of Crofab six, 12, and 18 hours after initial control to prevent recurrent venom effects. Um, that was studied in a randomized controlled trial and it showed that uh, giving this to patients with rattlesnake bites reduced the likelihood of local tissue injuries and caused a trend towards less recurrent coagulopathy and thrombocytopenia. That, ev that evidence is quite good for rattlesnake patients, patients with severe envenomation, and patients who had initial coagulopathy or thrombocytopenia. And personally, I do give maintenance therapy for those three groups. Patients with straightforward copperhead bites who don't ever show you a coagulopathy, who got initial control with the first dose, um, many, many people, including me when I was practicing out uh, east, uh, would watch those and give, uh, uh, treat any recurrence that happened, but not give the maintenance therapy. Uh, realistically, there's a lot of variation in practice. The package insert says to do it, and that's sort of the default, the safe, if you will, strategy. Um, if you're considering withholding maintenance therapy, I suggest you pick up the phone and uh, talk to an expert um, and help us walk you through this, because we, uh, we want to keep the patients out of harm's way, right? Our job is primarily to protect the patients, not to uh, protect patients before all. Um, copperhead victims. Um, there are a sizable minority of people out there who say that copperhead victims don't require antivenom. Uh, the logic goes something like this. Copperhead bites almost never kill people, maybe, uh, maybe one death a decade in the United States. Um, 
with the old antivenom, the risk probably did exceed the benefit for most bites, and I generally withheld antivenom from copperhead victims back in the old Wyeth antivenom days. Nowadays, it's a cost-benefit calculation that's a little bit uh, more difficult because we've observed that treating copperhead victims with antivenom uh, certainly causes a short-term benefit, seems to decrease the duration of the pain and swelling. And now we have a pilot study um, that will be published before this video uh, is out to you, uh, showing that patients can have pretty significant disability lasting two to three weeks that keeps them out of school, out of work, uh, out of enjoyment of their life. And the thought is that antivenom, we hope, we think, decreases this. It's a clinical trial ongoing and we'll know for sure in a few years. Again, uh, consult your local experts. Um, snake bite in the uh, eastern U.S. and the western U.S. are kind of different diseases, um, and you've got experts at hand. There is a new antivenom likely to come to the U.S. market. It is not yet FDA approved. Um, it's called Anavip. Um, it is made in Mexico and has been marketed in Mexico for a long time. It's an equine fab 2 made with modern processes. Uh, it has uh, a phase three U.S. trial that has been completed and the results have been presented. I'll show you their key slide in a minute. Um, if it is approved by FDA, um, it would come to the U.S. market in October 2018. There were some patent issues. The safety data from the clinical trial was actually quite promising. Its safety profile looks a lot more like a modern antivenom than an older equine antivenom, and I think that's probably true. Uh, once again, what's a FAB2? It's that cut where it says PEPs in there. So you have a larger molecule, longer half-life, theoretically more risk of uh, hypersensitivity, though whether that will be the case, we're just going to need good data. The trial, the pivotal trial that has been performed by the study published and FDA is, is reviewing um, soon, uh, uh, compared three strategies. The, um, the column all the way to the right is the FAB antivenom dose per the package insert, uh, where they got five vials and then after initial control, the maintenance therapy. The middle column was the FAB2 with uh, no maintenance dosing, and the column to the left was the FAB2 with uh, maintenance dosing. Um, and what they found was a statistically significantly smaller number of people with recurrent thrombocytopenia or coagulopathy in the groups that got the FAB antivenom, or the FAB2, the, the um, larger molecule stuff. Um, however, what was not really disclosed much in this patient is whether they were having minimal numeric things that nobody would think would put the patient at risk, or um, larger uh, you know, significant things which might actually have led to bleeding. Uh, there's only one patient in this trial that had, medically, that had serious late bleeding. It was fairly serious, we wound up getting some transfusions, and that was a patient in the FAB group. But there's no statistically significant difference between zero out of 40 and one out of 40. That's, uh, that is um, trend, it's not um, uh, significant. On the other hand, adverse effects were significantly more in the group that got the high dose of FAB antivenom. What's going to be the right answer? We're going to have to get this stuff out in the U.S. and see and collect some data, but I wanted to put it on your radar that it's coming someday because people are talking about it. Right now, um, you cannot get this stuff in the United States outside of an IND. You've hung with me through a lot. Uh, I hope some of this has been straightforward and hasn't been too esoteric. I want this to be useful to you. To help put all this together, uh, our group um, four years ago now got a group of experts from across the United States together, people with different backgrounds, different uh, um, uh, experience, uh, experience with different snakes. Got everybody in room, one room, gave them all baseball bats and, uh, and brass knuckles and let them fight it out for two days. And we walked out of the room with a unified treatment algorithm for the management of pit viper snake bite in the United States. Um, so this is a structured consensus document and it's designed to work everywhere. Uh, it seems to have stood the path, the test of time. Um, it is available um, uh, it, through an open access publisher, BMC Emergency Medicine. If you Google any three or four words in the title, it will appear on your screen with no need for medical library access. We provide it to you as a resource and we hope you find it helpful. That was absolutely a lot to digest. Um, I hope I broke it down into digestible bits and thank you very much for your time. Have a lovely day.